guests, welcome. This is an Epa rap critic and music is the love language mashup. I'm your boy Malik16 and no, it's not all right to kill if you want to kill. Probably not a, a great idea, but I'm joined today by a man who single-handedly has probably caused more Twitter and IG fights in the comments than a co-worker at happy hour. Uh, I'm gonna let him introduce himself. Who you be, bro? Who I be? Uh, <laughs> man, thank you. <laughs> nah, I just, my name is Clint Coley. Uh, I'm a comedian. Um, and I also have a podcast called Music is Love Language. And uh, a lot of times that what we do is, or what I do is I wanna have a uh, healthy conversation about music, about things that, or topics that I love in music, but I want it to be thought out and I want it to be well, well thought out. I don't just want somebody to say, oh, I like this album, that's it. Like to me, there's more to it than just that. So that's it, yeah, that's me in a nutshell. And he's being humble, he, he wears many hats, uh, a lot more than a comedian, the man DJs, I'm sure he's an entrepreneur and an actor on the side, I'm sure. <laughs> Am I, am I wrong? Well, no, I'm a, I'm a comedian and an actor. That's all that's first. Like everything I do with this podcast and music shit, that's that's just, that's for fun. Gotcha. Like I, you know, that's just something to do. That's all. Got you. Um, yeah, man. And everything you said, I echo this sentiment. That's the whole reason Effort Rap Pretty much started for us to create some kind of criteria and metric to end the barbershop debate. So we're not just screaming at the top of our lungs about stuff that we like. Cause if you like what you like, that's that's never gonna change. But understanding perhaps a little bit more why you like what you like and if what you're saying is factual, that's mm -hmm. what we're about here. Uh, and today, the classic album that we're going over turns 25 this year. Classic? <laughs> See, the hot takes have already started. Uh, the question we're posing today is how classic is this classic? And the album that we're talking about, of course, is none other than In My Lifetime, Volume 2 by Jay-Z, The Hard Knock Life, as most of us affectionately have come to know it. And uh, yeah, we're gonna get into it. This is category one, where we go over the album, the product itself. If you have not already, go check out Music is the Love Language. And while you're at it, take a moment to like and subscribe to this here channel, F a Rap Critic. A little background on this album, it was released on September 29th, 1998, same day as a few big projects. And this is Jay-Z's third studio release. And the first dimension that we talk about in category one is going to be quality of production. So Clint, who we got on the beats on there, man? So on this album, you got, uh, he Jay-Z doesn't lock in with just one producer, he has, a, an array of, of a few, right? So we know like Timbaland got a joint on there or a couple of joints on there. I'm not sure if he has more than one, but I know like the main one he got on there is uh, Jigga What, Jigga Who, that's, uh, that's Timbaland. Um, but the production overall on the album, in my opinion, is, 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 is top tier, if I'm being honest with you, right? Like, I don't think it's the best, I don't think it's his best, but that's neither here nor there. I think for the times, I think the production was great. I think that um, there are a lot of beats on that album that specifically fit Jay-Z's voice. And I think that was the first time on that album, I feel like in my opinion, that was the first time you heard like, like you don't feel, I don't feel like those beats could, be, could have been given to other artists. I feel like those beats, in my opinion, were specifically for Jay-Z. And there's a couple of joints on there that, 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 that resonate with that, uh, that, with my sentiment. So uh, that song, um, the joint with uh, him and Too Short a week ago, I think that 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 don't like beats like that literally just fit Jay Z's voice at the time of what he was trying to play. That's yeah. Ironically enough, that's the one beat from someone who I mean, by all standards, would be considered a no name. Jay Runner um, did the beat for a week ago. Swiss Beats just coming off the high of his yeah. production from DMX. So this is Jay Z mm -hmm. kind of giving an alley oop to Swiss Beats career same thing with Timbaland or vice that. versa or vice versa yeah oh, I mean, you gotta remember I don't think Jay-Z is giving them an alley-oop at the time you gotta remember like Swiss at the time you know if he's coming off the success of DMX like he hot you know what I'm saying like his career is already set you know what I'm saying and it doesn't matter right like DMX had already made a huge impact earlier in the year so we're talking September right 
like the album ZMX's, I think it's Dark and Hell is Hot is released when? Uh, the beginning of 1998 and then right. Flesh My Flesh is the end. It's the end of 98. So you got to remember that whole summer, right? Like, like that was a, that was a, a, around that time to me, that was a thing. So I don't think that, I don't think Jay-Z pushed co Swiss's career up to a different level. It, that's just my opinion. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think that. So we take into consideration the albums are mostly recorded at least like six months to, to a year earlier back in that era then this is still, you know, an, an article. I mean, it's written. early as Swiss Beast career. Yes, I will, I yeah. can attest to that. But I don't think it was, it was a, it was a, I don't think he was him throwing him an alley-oop. Cause let's be real too. Jay-Z is not a superstar just yet. In, in the articles written on this album, they talk about how his own camp were kind of like on the fence about him until Rough Riders Anthem. Now, if Rough Riders Anthem is a song that doesn't really pop until the summer, spring, summer, 98, then Jay-Z, if he sought him out, let's say in the 97 or beginning of the year, this is still him saying, let me check out this young guy. He's got some joints. At this point, Swiss is a rapper. Uh, I don't had, agree, I mean, but I, 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 I hear your take, but I don't agree with it. At this point, Swiss is a producer that has some joints, but it's not a guarantee, right? You're not gonna spend your budget on Swiss. Again, music. I don't think Jay-Z is a guarantee at this point either. Exactly, right? Same thing with Timbaland. Timbaland had proven himself in R&B, but not so much in hip hop. Okay. And so these were the beginnings of, of some things. Now the other production you get on here, uh, and, and you know, Jay-Z is rolling the dice, three tracks from Swiss on here, two tracks from Timbaland, Paper Chase is the other joint that Tim does. Um, and then of course you get DJ Premier, which at that time in the 90s was like if you're a new york rapper you had to have a premiere track you had to especially you, had to have a premiere track. you have to have a premiere track yes Absolutely. and so you, you have that um the trickiest track on here is reservoir dogs because it's credited to several different producers it's, set, it's credited to eric sermon and rockwilder and then there's a third person credited on there um but you know depending on what you read it'll give rockwilder the credit uh, and, and to give Eric Sermon the credit. But uh, Tricky Track, uh, which I don't think everybody rode equally. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. But uh, who else do you have on production here? Irv Gotti. Irv Gotti uh, enters, enters commercial space with Can I Get a What? And uh, that was a beat unlike any other beat at the time. And then of course, famously, you have Stevie J and Kid Capri to round it out. Got to definitely mention 45 King, the infamous Annie sample, which Jay in his book Decoded said he had to write a letter personally to the uh, composers or the owners of the rights and make up this elaborate lie about how seeing that play as a youngster changed his life is genius. And, uh, the fact that he snitched on himself about that shows that he's kind of untouchable. But I love he kind he kind of and he also had to do somebody that I know personally had to do the same thing with the tape. That that sample almost did not get cleared. Oh, from the doors! Wow, wow. Yeah, that sample almost did not clear. That's like. There's a there is a there is a there is a multiverse where the takeover sample does not get cleared and it doesn't happen. Exclusive fun facts here, man. Mm -hmm. So you get a range. I think a lot of the beats when you hear them all together, they sound like what was going on at the time. You agree with that? I agree with that. For anything sure. anything sound dated in its production? In my opinion, yeah, it does. I think that it does in this it, like. For me, that album doesn't really stand the test of time when it comes to, in my opinion, when it comes to the production itself, right? Because I think that when I hear, even though it still sounds good for 98, when I hear that album, I still just, it, it's it's a 98 album. I don't feel like that production or that, that I don't think it fits today, today, or I don't even think it fits 10 years ago, if we're being honest. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think that album was probably dated less than 10 years after it came out. Like by the time, you know, that was one of them albums I didn't really go back to, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm being 100% if I'm being honest. Yeah, I, I, if I'm counting the bonus tracks, then Dame Dash is actually also credited uh, with production for It's All Right. And then mm -hmm. Jermaine Dupree on Money Ain't A Thing. Um, and so he's, he's doing this thing where he creates this soundscape where almost every song could be a single. We'll talk about that more as we go. 
But uh, yeah, when we talk about dated sounds, there's a moment, I think, Ride or Die, the DBJ production, that sounds like pop, uh, like a pop song of that time. Like, mm -hmm. J-Lo would have sang over that beat. And it was deliberate because Jay has gone on record as saying, volume one in my lifetime felt too slow for him. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this was his attempt to make sure he's getting enough up-tempo, plug, ready songs, and mission accomplished. So if that's something mm -hmm. that, you know, you want to take into account, then that's all something to consider on a scale from one to five. For you, five being the highest, one being the lowest, what would you give this for quality of production? About a 3.5. 3.5, cool, that's a 3.5. That takes us to dimension two, the cohesiveness of the album. How well does it glue together? How's that sequencing? What's the flow of the album like? Um, I don't believe Heart Knock Life tells an entire story, right? Cohesiveness is like, does it tell a story through the album? Like, is it like, you know, I'm listening to track one. Does it go right into track, not go right into it, but it's like, is it a seamless transition between track two, between track three, and it's not like that at all, in my opinion. Um, it is not a it is not a co very cohesive album. I do think that you can tell like there was a lot. He, it, to me, there was like there was like we knew. They, in my opinion, it was like they knew the songs they wanted on the album, and then there were other songs that they just said, "Okay, I'm gonna just throw this shit on there, and we'll see what happens." Yeah, in my yeah, opinion, there's there's ideas here that you can tell went somewhere but like you said never landed right so he 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 gets pain in the ass involved again who has been on his previous two albums and you get the whole carlitos way you get the whole goodfellas homages mixed in there but it only happens in the beginning and like after the fourth song and then nothing else to round it out that would be the only thing that glues it together and tells some kind of story and that's but not enough it's not enough and yeah the 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 sounds the range of sounds are so diverse and all over the place that it doesn't package you in any particular feeling, right? The sounds that it's all right by the time you get to the end of the album are not the same sounds as uh, it was all good just a week ago or the intro, which is cool. You want diversity, but futuristic up-tempo is what they were going for. Every beat here was pretty new to hip hop. Most of the beats here were new to hip hop. You didn't hear Jigga What like that. You didn't hear Can I Get A What What? And that's kind of what drew Jay-Z to it. It's Ja Rule's song originally, he hears it. He's like, oh, let me get that. And he's talking about flowing futuristic on it. Um, but yeah, the album itself telling the story, it's a question. Now, from an executive producer standpoint, if I'm thinking about the placement of tracks, would you change the arrangement at all? Or it kind of makes sense how it is? I wouldn't change the arrangement only because for me, it's like, there was, there's no reason to, right? Like what would I, what really, what would I put before? Like, because there's no, with those songs, it's not, I don't feel like there was a lot of, there was a lot of movement for you to move around in a sense, right? Like I'm looking at the track listing right here and I'm just like, well, where would I put certain things? Like, where would I put money in a thing? Like, yo, like the cohesion is, is, is ass. If I'm being honest, <laughs> if, I, if you're when you ask me if I'm gonna give it a one or a ten, I mean a one or a five, it's gonna be a, a, a one, maybe wow. it's maybe a one, one point five. Like it's not. Gotcha. Yeah, when I think of and I hate comparing albums to albums because we're looking at this is just one body of work. Yeah, we're looking at. But one of Jay Z's signature things is how strong his final song is. For all intents and purposes, when this when this album came out, this was the era of the bonus songs. So It's All Right and Money Ain't a Thing were considered bonus songs. It ended with It's Like That, which was also a song. A lot of these songs were featured on other projects. This was on Kate Capri's album. Mm -hmm. that came Mixed out it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Money Ain't a Thing was on Jermaine Capri's album. Okay, uh, can, I get a, can I Get a was on the uh, Rush Hour soundtrack, I believe. Right. And so for it to end with It's Like That, which is not, it doesn't have any gravitas to it. It's just a braggadocious song. Uh, I thought that was a, an interesting choice on Jay's part. So you said a 1.5 for this? For me, yeah. For cohesiveness, cool. Something for y'all to consider. And uh, that takes us to Dimension 3. Dimension 3, I think we've been 
inching towards this slightly it's the question of what's the intentional mood and tone of this album and i always tell you know people it's not the mood you get when you listen to it it's the mood you think they were going for and how well they executed it um i think here is it's in all the reviews that have been written about this over time this is something you realize later on retrospectively this is jay's play for what he what he ultimately gained right that pop stardom this is the trl era and he's looking at his peers who shoot up quicker right uh this is the the year prior i always call it the diddy year those albums are going no less than double platinum right mace comes out diddy no, no way out no way out like after every, death was out mm -hmm. right every release and then dmx comes out the gate big pun everybody's going platinum like candy Jay-Z struggled to, to get platinum uh, those first two outings. And he's like, nah, I need to be top of the charts. I need to be total request live. I need that middle America audience. He was trying to cross over. Right, there, there's the word I'm looking for, right? And he, he achieves it and it sounds like grab back. Like you said, every they knew the songs they wanted to go on the album. It's like, this could be a hit, this could be a hit. It's an album full of hits. And I think that's what always took away from it sounding in New York, and you're from the East Coast, so you you probably remember these combos too. People swear by this album. The hood dudes think this is Jay Z's best. This is up there with reasonable doubt to most of them. Not in whose hood? Back back in those times, that was the combo. Probably until Blue I Blue mean, Blue. you also you also got to think of how people viewed albums back in those times too, right? Like I, I think a lot of times people look, uh, you know confused impact with with it being a good album right yeah. so like the album had extreme outrageous impact but it only had outrageous impact because of the because of the title track right like you got let's 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 be for real the title track is what makes is kind of what this is what changes this is this is and you know i'm a i'm a i'm a marvel fan and i watch a lot of the uh a lot of the movies and the television shows and stuff like that and one thing that they talk about when it comes to the multiverse and they talk about time right one thing is there's called uh absolute points in time times where it's like times that cannot be changed no matter what happens this always has to happen in my opinion this is jay-z's absolute point in hip-hop in history right Absolutely. He, this is his absolute point this is the point where like i'm gonna be honest with you if this album doesn't do or if these singles don't do well this album doesn't do well we may not we may not know the jay-z that we know today absolutely and and you say you say you ask me like who i would i would say up until 444 and, and american gangster this was the album in contention with blueprint and reasonable doubt that people talked about you might hear some I black album i don't know why i don't know why I don't know. I, why. I think, but wait, but also when you say people, right? Like everybody's different. Opinions is different. I don't. The same thing you heard. I didn't hear that, right? I didn't hear kids oh. raving about. I I didn't. Or even around that time, like this album, it was like, yo, this is cool. This is a good Jay Z album. But I don't. I don't remember. And, and also, let's be real too, right? When you talk about somebody's best album, he only had three bodies of work at that point. And by the way, don't forget, we didn't care about Reason for Doubt when it first came out. Right, but that's what I'm saying. Even up until American Gangster and 444, people were putting this in the top five. Jay himself, when he did that famous post where he arranged his albums, he puts Hard Knock Life very high. He says this that's is it. the album that made him it changed the life. It changed his life. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the, I think it's dwindled since he's put out more albums, but it definitely at the time would put me off it felt like a compilation it felt like mm -hmm. it felt to me just like jd's album that came out with mm -hmm. the light and what is that well, it was a 1472 or something like that like right. 14 or 1492 or some shit like that it felt it's like oh this is a this is an album full of full of singles and that's why people like it i but agree i agree that's what they were going for it it's like it's a can't lose album if paper chase was a single it was gonna work if uh it's like that was a single it was gonna work but mm -hmm. what they went with are the singles that echo the time so perfectly. So mm -hmm. I think mission accomplished. All right, so on a scale from one to five, what would you give this for how well they executed the mood and tone they were going for? I mean, I'm only going to give it a five because again, he was looking for hits and he found them. I mean, that's just the bottom line. He was looking to score on the pop charts and he did it. You know what I'm saying? Like, if that's the mood that, like, I don't think, I mean, here's the thing. I don't think there was a mood for the album. I think there was a mood for songs, and then I think that their album just came with it. 
You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't feel like they was, I, that's just my opinion, but I'm going to give them a five because if they were trying to execute Jay-Z becoming a star. Yeah, they they did it. Um, yeah, the, the tone has that. It's a commercial tone. This is the album that made a lot of haters hate Jay-Z hard. Uh, yeah. For me, this this created the deviation. I probably started deviating before. I, I think the the one volume one turned me off. I was a Jay fan for the first album, and then it was for all the, in my lifetimes I was a, a Jay hater. So he didn't give me back until the Dynasty album. All right, yeah, something for y'all to consider on the scale from one to five. Dimension four, the song distinction versus repetition of words and sounds. So this is where we talk about how we're, the redundant elements sonically and the redundant elements in words. Now, I, I always make the distinction that some rappers, or most rappers, if they're keen, they're doing intentional branding. If you hit them saying they're blocked multiple times or their label or their name, that's intentional. But then some rappers, a lot of rappers actually, just repeat phrases or chants or words because they run out of words. They're just lazy writers. Um, same thing with producers. We talked about how diverse the sounds are. We talked about how many producers are on here. Are there any tracks on here where you feel like, damn, this sounds just like track six sounds like track 10? I mean, you're not gonna get the same sound because you you also gotta remember there's thousands. I'm looking at this joint, there's Premier, the 45 King, Stevie, Stevie J, J Runner, Tim, like you're not gonna get the same, like those are, the, all of those producers have different, different, right. different sounds. There's no way you're gonna get the same sound. So, so that's the that's the saving grace there. Uh, a lot of times, and that and that is kind of the Achilles heel if, of working with one producer. If the producer doesn't have that diversity and range, then yeah, you might get those instances where damn track six sounds like track ten. I, it's hard to say with this album, right? When it comes to redundancy, right? Because again, it's not really. It's this is really not an album where he's trying. Like he is he he's looking to score baskets. Mm -hmm. Like that. Like he's not like. And I, and I hate to say this, right? And I'm not, I know we're not talking about the blueprint, right? But I think on the blueprint, he was out the show. He's the best rapper ever, right? Mm -hmm. He wanted to, like, if you notice on the blueprint, like, none of, none of the, like, a lot of the, like, he was, he wasn't taking bars off on the blueprint. You know what right. I'm saying? Like, it was like, I'm going to show you how lyrically you got, you know, I know I, now I, he's like, I know I, I got the hits now. Mm -hmm. I've spent three years making hits now i can go into the, into this and i can make me a purple rain a thriller whatever you want to call it. you know what i'm saying yeah i know there's probably one or two commercial joints on there girl girls but even on those on those songs he's spitting right yeah. like even even on izzo he's spitting like you know he says i'm overcharging niggas for what they did to the coke like that is a that's just like he's he, he's he's spitting and i'm gonna be honest with you even on the on the song hard not like he's spitting for real for real, if we really listen to the lyrics i say all that to say that's hard. That's a hard question to answer because I just don't think that the, he was that the re redundancy is is it, it's going to be redundant because you're trying to you're trying to to, to make hits. You're trying to make hits. Uh, you're In talking you're talking thematically, right? So yeah, and, like here's the thing, because you know I tell I say that classic albums are like championship rings, right? And at, up to that point. You know, even though we go back and we say that Reasonable Out was a classic, but at that point, we, we didn't think he had a ring. He was out to get a championship ring on that one, right? So, like, on this album, Jay-Z was trying to hit, get singles. Here, this album is trying, and we see Jay in his trying phase probably throughout that whole In My Lifetime yeah. trilogy. He's trying. He's like, yeah. oh, there's, there's, and we'll talk about this in, in a few more dimensions, uh, even, even down to the way he's picking who's on it. Uh, everything's strategic. So, okay, beat diversity we have. There's not a lot of repetition or redundancy there. Let's talk about words. Uh, Jay is a wordsmith. I don't think you're hearing Jay run out of words. I don't think you're hearing anything repetitive where it's like, did he just use this line or did he say the same kind of hook on another song? Agreed? I agree. Okay, so on a scale from one to five, for song distinction here, what we giving this? It's like a three and a half, and that's it's not because it's not good. It's just it's he's not doing it. That is, I'm not giving you points for doing something and you you didn't you're not great at it. It's, it was it was cool. So I, now, as a matter of fact, I'm gonna give him a two point five. Okay, fair enough. Takes us to dimension five. We at the halfway point now. 
uh, this is about the ratio, the balance, the amount of songs versus the amount of content. So technically 12 songs, 14 if you count the two bonus. How much substance is Jay giving you on an album with that many songs? I always say, this is your safe range for classic albums. Standard, you know, the holy grail of classics is 10, Thriller, Illmatic, 10 songs, very hard to, to F that up, right? But as we add more, and, and hip hop loves to give you like 24 track albums, 14 is probably the highest you go before it becomes absolutely questionable. Um, and he, he floats in this territory, 12 to 14 tracks. How much substance are we getting? I mean, not, when you, what, what, I want you to, what, what do you mean by substance, by the way, right? Are you saying like, like, when you say substance, I want to know what your definition of substance before I ask you. I, I'm interested in your definition of substance because it's an album, I mean, right? It's a rap album. It's not a, a completely braggadocio album. There's points where he deviates from braggadocio to talk about stuff. Is there a decent balance of what's being talked about? No, not really. No, I mean, let's let's be real, right? Like, he ain't really talking about shit on this album. If we, if we really being honest, right? Like, money, cash, hoes, like, what is he really talking about? J, A, Y, I, flow, sick. All, fuck, all y'all hate his blow. Like, what is he talking, like, what are you talking about? What, right. you, what are you talking about? Yes, the, 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 you know, a week ago is about a nigga snitch. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, hard knock life. You know, I know what he's talking about. You know, I think it was an ode to Biggie Smalls too, in, in that too. But you know, like he ain't really, but he ain't talking about shit. Like, and if we be an honest man, like if he can I get it? He not, yeah, he's not talking about shit on this album. He's not really talking about shit on this album. I'm gonna right. give this a 1.5. Like, it's not. This wasn't a lot. This wasn't a a a a. a, a, a and I don't want to say conscious, right? Because you don't have to be conscious to be talking about something, right? Right. But he's, not, again, he's chasing hits. They don't give a fuck. When you're chasing a hit, nobody cares what you're saying. It's yeah. about, do you know, is it about the beat? And it's about the the words, you know, like, is this, is the hook catchy? Yeah. Beat and hook. So he he knocked that out the park, right? Hard not life. I mean, it's a hard not. That's a, that's a catchy ass hook. Uh, money cash holes. That's a catchy ass hook. You know, can I get a what, what? That's a catchy ass look. You know what I mean? But it's like, I got a condo with nothing but condoms in it. Like, that, you're not talking yeah. about nothing. Like, right? He's not talking about nothing. I, I would say the substance is about a 1.5. Yeah. In, in again, in this In My Lifetime trilogy is where he sacrificed substantive stuff the most in his career. Because, you know, again, like you said, when Reasonable Doubt came out, we're not looking at it through the same lens as we are now, but there's so much stuff that we appreciate in hindsight and retrospectively about because that's where that's got substance, substance right. in that album. Where he took you into the hustler's mind. Like, yeah, it's an album all about hustling. Like you said, he's not talking about the government on No, the but it's the, there's there's substance in talking about hustling, right? Like Yeah, and so you only get glimpses of that on a track like it's a week ago. A week ago is reminiscent of that could have been that could have been on reasonable doubt. Yeah, maybe not beat wise, but as far as but the, the substance wise, yes. Yeah, absolutely. And so you get out of twelve tracks, you probably get about four if you want to throw hard knock life in it because he he does what Nas claims he does, right? Nas says <laughs> famously said on "You Owe Me," it's still him being him because he said "Pay me back like forty acres to blacks." I was like, really, Nas? <laughs> so. If you ask Jay, Jay would probably say that he felt like he's slipping in some knowledge in there because he's speaking for the underprivileged. But I'm like, you're really just bragging most of that song. You're big enough, Biggie, you're bragging, and then you slip some lines in there about, this is how we live in the hood, right? But the, the more direct songs that, that are about something, If I Should Die, the sequel to Coming of Age, and a week ago, everything else is loose. If you want to consider the songs to women, like, can I get a what, what? It's topical, that is a topic. So you're getting about five songs on a 12, 12 song album uh, with substance. I don't know if that's a even balance, but there's something there for the ratio. It's not a complete one to 10. So dimension six, the features. Now features on here, cause features could either help an album or hurt an album. They can either dilute it and make it feel like a compilation, or you can give it that boost you need and that break from the monotony of one voice. Uh, how you feel about the features on here? Who we got, first of all? 
you got Too Short, you got DMX, you got Beanie Siegel, you got Memphis Bleak, you got uh, Foxy Brown, you got uh, Jazz, Jazz O, um, you got um, the Rangers. You got Kid- yeah, I mean, these aren't crazy features, right? Like, except for DMX, that's the only feature that's like a because you got to remember DMX's verse on on, on Money Cash Holes is, is like is damn near iconic, right? It's like he changes the song, right? In, yeah. in my opinion, like he changes he changes the entire tone of the song. You know what I'm saying? Um, the features, I'm it's cool, right? It's cool. Like it's like the features fit the time. You got Mill, you got Ja Rule, you got a lot yeah, of like that, who are that fits the time that fits coming the time. on the scene, right? Uh, that fits Jay-Z. the time. It definitely fits the time. It, it's it's branching into this idea. This is also the start of this idea of the rock empire. Like, oh, we're a dynasty. This is the dy- it's the beginning of the dynasty, all right? So I'm comfortable enough now as I'm still trying to propel myself to stardom, superstardom. I want to introduce some people uh, that mm-hmm. I, I'm planning to roll out. So. You get a mill who's a part of this group called Major Coins, and I think the other member of Major Coins is the the person you hear on "It's Like That" doing the hook lips. Mm-hmm. And the Rangers, Wise, and Half, they were managed by Rockefeller, but not signed to Rockefeller. But they were supposed to be next up because they were on the Streets Is Watching soundtrack too. So they come and they they get equal or even billing with Jay-Z, well, not even bar-wise, but the fact that they're not given like one verse to split, like, here y'all go. <laughs> they, they they each get a verse, they do the hook with him. This is a big look for them on, on a Jay-Z album, because you don't hear Jay do this with other rappers for a, for a while after this. This is the last time you'll see him on the track with, a, with artists you've never heard of. Uh, Bleak gets three looks on this album, and he's being talented. He's being touted as next up. And for a moment in time, for that year, a lot of us believe that. <laughs> a lot of the hip hop audience. You from New York, right? Yep. All right, well, that makes sense. Yeah, a lot of hip hop. You know what? I realize New York has a very, y'all are just extremely delusional when it comes to <laughs> this shit, dog. New York is the most delusional hip hop place because y'all, it's it's New York or, or bust for y'all. It's yeah. like nobody else believed Bleak was like next up. We didn't believe that shit. You did. But nobody, yeah. none of it, you did. We did Jay not. Jay sold it so hard. He sold, I mean, so y'all, so yeah, y'all from New York. What part of New York? Are you from Brooklyn? No, I'm from Harlem. From Harlem, yeah. Like, oh, I, never, are, I never bought it. But what I'm, what I'm saying is this was- oh, But I get what you're saying. He was trying to sell it, yes. We weren't, was, I wasn't buying it. <laughs> you weren't buying it at all. I mean, he went hard. No one could ever say Jay did not go hard. He tried, he tried for me, yes. I mean, the whole intro is dedicated to Bleak. It's it's a sunning intro to, to say, oh, this person's gonna be the new and improved me. Yikes. What an intro. <laughs> but where people probably should have directed their attention to this is the very first appearance of Beanie Siegel. We did. Now we I paid attention to that, but you always gotta remember it's a different situation over here in Philadelphia. I mean I'm not in Philly, I live in Los Angeles, but it's a different situation in Philadelphia. You know what I'm saying? So we, so we he didn't was sleep. on the radar. Out there. He was already on the radar. I knew who Beanie Siegel was before Reservoir Dogs. Wow. Yeah. And he he was kind of an afterthought until maybe the next year on this track. Uh, Reservoir Dogs. People were still talking about Sauce Money. Sauce yes. Money was the the go to rock feature. Jazzo was also an afterthought. Like, oh yeah, come and finish this. Um, is there anybody on there that harmed the album? Their present. When we look back, not in my opinion, I don't think anybody hurt the album. I don't, because I, everybody fit with it. Again, it's what the album was trying to do, right? He's not, hits, you know, and nobody fucked up. And then the hit, you know, like, you know, and then the joints that we talk about, like I'm trying to think, um, um, Money Cash Holes was the third single that came out in December of that year, right? Mm-hmm. But. Of course we, but my thing is, does DMX hurt it? No, he, it's, and I, I don't even think it's really just his startup too. It's just like the vo- the verse was just that powerful. You know what I'm saying? So I say that to say, I don't think anybody hurt that album. No. When we when we go back to the Emil verse, Emil gets a lot of, a lot of flack. There's a lot of, part of a lot of jokes. Is that a, a listenable verse? 
still to this day. Emil, I know what I'm expecting from Emil though. That's the thing, right? Like Emil wasn't this lyrical beast that we were all, like it was Emil. She had a, a decent verse and she did what she was supposed to do and got the fuck out of there. Like, I don't think she ruined it, right? Like the song, I don't really like the song period, to be honest with you. That's not my favorite Jay shit, but I'm not expecting, I'm not expecting lyricism from Emil. Like who was? Y'all, you are? Well, we didn't know Emil. This is our introduction to Emil, and for a lot of people, this nah, is the I, This is the yeah. introduction to Ja Rule. Uh, I remember, and, and Ja Rule's voice is just distinct enough from DMX at this point to not get the comparisons the way he got later, but it, he also was someone who was an afterthought. As the song blew up, people paid more attention, but it wasn't until he came out with Holla Holla, the, the following, he was like, oh, that guy from Can I Get a What? Right. When we think about the fact that this was his song, could you picture this? Could you picture three verses of Ja Rule on that beat? No. <laughs> and would it have the same hit? It probably, maybe, maybe not. I, 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 that's hard to say, right? Because Ja Rule had a specific style too, right? Um, and also, Ja Rule had something that we were, I don't know, and I'm trying, I always try to go back to Ja Rule's career, career and figure out like, what did he have that we just that we that we loved? I, I can't I can't put my finger on it just yet. I got I I still got to do my homework. I don't figure out what, but it was something about Ja Rule that people loved. I just don't know what it was, and I I think that would have came through depending on how the song would have been arranged. Got you. You got the locks on Reservoir Dogs or the most talked about song feature wise on this album. Uh, this rock meets locks equal pairing. Thought it was pretty uh, brilliant how they did that. Three verses here, a little talking about pain in the ass, and then here's this uh, other set of three verses. Do you remember the talk? The, the talk about that posse track. I mean, I just remember like it was. I mean, it was a big like. You got to remember, right? So like for me, that song was just a big deal because it was Beanie Seagulls coming out party. It was finally like, yo, that we got a guy from Philly. Like in like who can spit spit like no no diss to black thought no but we got a guy who like perfectly represents the street life of what we what you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. um I just do remember like I mean you guys just this, the song it was it was it was a lot of motherfuckers trying to get off that's yes. what I know of. that's what I that, that was the talk about Reservoir Dogs it was everybody was getting off on that track Kiss got off Beans got off. like you know what I'm saying motherfuckers got that was the one song where it's like niggas got off you know what I'm saying so yeah when I when I listen back to it. Everything you want a posse cut to do because yeah. this person gives you something that the other person did not, right? So technically, yeah. bar wise, Beanie probably gives you the best. She gives you the most intricate descriptive stuff. Jay and Jada give you the slickest talk. Styles gives you the most gangster. And yeah. Saul gives you all the punchlines. Every line is a punchline. DMX is the feature, like you said. It, when we talk about a conversation of features helping or hurting now he absolutely helped his presence on this on this song on this album in general because he's hands down the hottest rapper that year um up north at least we count master no, p in the south no he's the he's the hottest rapper i don't want to hear that soft shit. <laughs> so all right that's that's stevie j I, even though I heard this was D Dot in the beginning, but it makes more sense to the Stevie J since he produced it. Stevie J's talking in the beginning of Why to Die, and he says famously, "I'm rolling with Rockefeller because they got all the money." But at the time, he is one of Bad Boy's in-house hitman producers, so that's a big deal. Just that statement right there at the beginning of the song. Is it? I don't think it was a big deal. It adds fuel to the fire as this song is talked about as a diss track. Me. I'm too young. I was in the dark. I never understood when people were saying this is this track. I think a couple of years later, this whole song is about mix. Yeah. But that's that's behind the scenes stuff. Like you'd have to be in the loop to know that. So yeah, I thought I always thought it was interesting that Jay chose to do a whole subliminal song about a subliminal beef. But it's corny. All right, Foxy, her verse, her present. She, she sounded very little Kim like on that. I, I, I know she the, gave the firm more, way. She gave the firm and Nas way more than she gave Jay Z. Yeah, she sounded so much like Kim on there. I, the stands are gonna kill me for whoever's respective fan base. But I, I vocally, she sounded different on that track. But it's, it's my favorite track on the whole album, Paper Chase. Also, want to give Jermaine Dupri his props for being able to hold his own 
he definitely held his own on money. He definitely held his own. I, I will not just. I will not deny that man that he definitely hold, held his own. Definitely Unexpected. Held his own. Totally definitely un- held his own. <laughs> yeah, he got. He got a, his verses. His verses crazy. Low key. Yeah. Yes. If, if you read them, they 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 kind of on the same level of slickness. And he wrote. Uh, and he wrote the beat very well. He did. He did. One thing, Jermaine Dupri, whether he's writing for someone else or himself, he knows where to land on beat. So. Got to give him those props. On a scale from one to five heartbeats, what you giving this uh, for the features? It's a three. Like it wasn't nothing crazy, but it was like it was cool. Yeah, it just it was cool. It was cool. Yeah, three. Takes us to Dimension Seven. Does the weakest song or do the weakest songs on the album? That's a, I hate that dimension. I hate to, I hate to cut you off, but that's a mm-hmm. that's a hard. That's I hate that dimension. Like, but I the question it. is. Does it bring the album down? Every every that's a, every that's a subjective take because nobody knows what the weakest song is. Like to you, the weakest song could be one thing, and to me, the weakest song could be something else. That's exactly why it exists. We all have a song that we skip, no matter how classic the album is. On Thriller, I might skip. Uh, I, I said that yes, that I right. and I got flat I might that. Skip the girl is mine, right? I literally uh, said that verbatim. But I don't feel like any of the songs on that album take away from it. How does it, how does one song bring an album down? You remember when we were talking about the cohesiveness earlier? One song could kill the whole flow. Well, People, this album is not cohesive at all. It's always subjective, right? But if we go by by this metric, it's the idea of let's think of the songs that we skip. What do you skip on this album? Uh, shit, I skip. Hard Knock Life. I skip If I Should Die. I, I only come to this album for like four songs and I did. Okay. So the, what's the weakest song on here to you? The one that you just never listened to? Ride or Die by Stevie J. Right. With Stevie J. I don't listen to it. Does that put a dent in the album? Is it is this an album where you feel like, man, if I just took this off, it would be a little better? Or does that chip away at the album at all? Okay. It doesn't. No, it doesn't. For me. Okay. Then, then in this case, right, when I ask you on the scale for one to five, it would it would be a five because it doesn't take away from from it. Yeah, but that's a okay. <laughs> that or or you put a number to it. That's why that's why I'm asking. It's, it's because you said so. I'm gonna give it a one because I gave the cohesiveness a one, right? Mm-hmm. So just because I take away one song doesn't make the album better or worse. It's just it's, the album still. I can take away this on this album. I can take away one song and the, and the album is still I still feel the same way about the album I don't give a fuck it could be the hit song right I can t- only song you can't replace on this album is Hard Knock Life everything else is replaceable why not why not Hard Knock Life because it's the title track to the album and it's the song that brought Jay- that gave Jay Z his it, it's that's what that is the song that changed Jay Z's career bottom line like I, it's not and, and that's the problem we can, we're sitting here talking about this album like the album changed his career no the song changed his career, which made us go buy the album. I do not think that the album changed his career. I think the song is what made him. It, if you don't have that hit song, it nothing, no, nothing. It, 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 Ooh, what it, a hot take. That's cool. But, that's cool. But that takes us right to Dimension 8. Dimension 8, Mass Appeal. Did this album have the reach from the gate? No. You, now, you've been saying Hard Knock Life is the song. And that I feel like that's revisionist history. The song that took him where he needed to be was "Can I Get Up." That was the song that got him I on think, that. I got think, this, but you also got to remember where the song was. It wasn't on the Hard Lock Life album. That song was on the "Can I Get Up." Was on the Rush Hour soundtrack that did same, well. Same year. It's not the same thing, but it's not the same thing, though, right? Like no, if you're telling same me, year. That's the same but, year. Yeah, it could be the same year, but it's but but here's the thing: that "Can I Get Up" exists with or without the Hard Knock Life album. Am I right or wrong? That that song came out on the Rush Hour soundtrack. That did not that did not elevate Hard Knock Life the album. The song Hard Knock Life elevated Hard Knock Life the album. It was always going to be on this album. It's still a single. You don't, where where else I it lands? See, you don't do you know do you know that? You know that for a fact? Where else it lands? Do you know that for a fact that that was going to be on the album regardless of the of the soundtrack? It was made for the sick for the album. Do you know that for a fact? Is what I'm asking. All of these songs, with the exception of maybe Money Ain't a Thing, were made for this album, and then placement happens. Okay. 
But you can't tell me a song makes an album if it's on a different, if it just comes out on, a, on another album first. What a what a what a arbitrary uh, criteria there. <laughs> you can't tell me that. You can't tell me that a song makes an album if it's on another out on another album first. Like that is not why we went to go buy. You're trying to you're trying to make the case that oh well, can I get it was the reason why we bought Hard Knock Life. No, bro. No. The reason why we I got Hard Knock Life was because of Hard Knock Life. No, I'm saying Hard Knock Life got its crossover success because of Can I Get It. I totally disagree with that. And you also gotta remember, dog, like motion pictures, right? Motion picture companies literally have contracts with people like MTV and stuff like that. It ele- like they're trying to do what they can to get people to see the, to see the movie. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm. That's what I'm trying to explain to you, right? So my thing is, is, like, it doesn't like at the end of the day, right? The song "Can I Get It" is not the reason that Jay Z was became a superstar. It was like, oh, oh yeah, this is cool, but hard knock life is what did it. I'm not having revisionist history. I was, I witnessed it in real time. Bottom line, I witnessed it. I witnessed it. I was there. You were there. What are, what are the two other singles? On, 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 on Hard Knock Life? On this album, yeah. Money Cash Hoes. Uh-huh. And which came what? out after Hard Knock Life. And then the last single was Nigga what? what, Nigga Who. Okay. Right. So, do any of those songs bolster the sales? After the hard knock life song that came out, <laughs> that came out first. Mm. I remember. Can I get a what? What? <laughs> can I get a what? I remember. Can I get a getting played all year? I remember hard knock life only getting played for the season that that single was dropped. Can I get a lasted on radio into the next year? And and we saw lots more. Well, that's the reason why people bought, bought the album was because of can I get a switch saying. I, I can't speak to why people, but it's what. That's it, why. That's what. The, that's what. That's to you. That's what changed that. that so can I get it? Is the reason why hard my life was what it was. It's not to me. Go go look it up on record. It's okay. it's the decided. It's the decidedly more popular single. Okay. Right. So if we if we put up the the singles and charting data, then we put that. Now you're saying this kind of cut into because it was on the soundtrack. Yeah, I'm I'm looking at the singles and charting data. Uh, uh, can I get a didn't even make number one, Chief? Mm-hmm. Hard with Knock Jay-Z, Life was Jay Z. Hard Knock Life one? on the other time, on the other hand, did reach number one. It reached number one on. So I'm looking. What, what, what charts are you? So I'm looking at the you know, certifications, right? Mm-hmm. So the single Hard Knock Life is a platinum selling single. Can I get a is not a is not a platinum selling single. Can I get this? Not a platinum selling single. No. That's wild. I tried to tell you, but you know. <laughs> that is wild. U.S. Billboard Hot 100, right? Can I get it? Was number 19. U.S. Hot R&B and Hip Hop songs. It was number six. U.S. Hot Rap songs. It was number 22. U.S. Mainstream Top 40. It was number 27. U.S. Rhythmic, it was number two. Whatever the fuck rhythmic means, <laughs> all right? And then Hard Knock Life, right? Uh, it's top 10 in all of it. U.S. Billboard Hot 100 is number, it was number It was number 15, but it's high, still higher than Can I Get It. U.S. R&B and Hip Hop songs, it was number 10. U.S. Hot Rap songs, it was number two. And United States is an RIAA Platinum Certified single. A million you. people bought it. That is Again, mind-blowing. it changes the album. It's mind-blowing that uh, Can I Get It is not a platinum single. That song was everywhere. Check me. <laughs> Only you would turn this into an argument, but it, it, yeah. It's not an argument. I'm just, I, I, I like having some fun, but no, uh, all jokes aside, though, I, I see what you're saying about Can I Get It. I'm not denying the impact of the single. I just don't think that was what, what that's not why. That's not why people flock to the album. Hard Knock Life, I'm looking now, is Jay-Z's first platinum selling single. That should tell you everything you need to know. Which, which is nuts, because from a audience standpoint, you heard Money Cash Hoes and Can I Get a What What longer on the platforms, so the video and radio platform. Uh, so it, it, it really is interesting how sales work compared to what's popular. But you also got to think white people too, bro. Yeah. Like you, you. I think we, we, we vastly, we vastly underestimate white people's presence when it comes to, you know, 
uh, buying hip hop and consuming hip hop, right? You only talk, like, again, we're listening to it from our perspective, right? But you have to think, Hard Not Life was a, that was a, like, nationwide, like, that was what introduced white people to Jay-Z. And that's, and that's what I was at, that's what I'm getting at in this dimension, right? The idea of, do you think when he, when he took the extra step, because I was thinking about this as I was looking into that, I'm like, what the hell would make him, the artist himself, not his handler, write a letter, and, and believe in this beat so much that he took the time out to do that. Do you think he knew it was going to have that kind of effect? Uh, with the uh, with the Hard Knock Life drum? Yep. Uh, yeah, I do think he knew. I think he, that's why he had to write the letter. That's why he uh, was championed so hard to get the sample clear because I do believe he knew that that single was going to do what it did. I do believe that, yes. Yeah. So on a, on a scale from one to five heartbeats, what are we, what are we giving it for, for Mass Appeal? One to five. How, how much Mass Appeal did it have? Mm -hmm. It's a five. It's a five. Okay. It's so five. that's where he shines. Dimension nine, the three eyes, that's impact, innovation, and influence. It has impact, that's it. No, nothing innovated on here, huh? No, because I don't think other people listen to this. Other other musicians, other rappers, other people listen to this album. Was like, ah, this is like this. It didn't feel different to me. This didn't feel like a. It felt different in a sense of I'm I'm hit chasing. That's what was different about this album. But as far as like sonically, stuff, there was nothing different about it. The only different was Jay Z was chasing singles. I, I I do say you know to to the to the point that we raised earlier. I think him and Swiss started this. Uh, symbiotic relationship where they both catapulted each other's careers commercially and then i do want to give jay props for validating timbaland and hip-hop this timbaland had rappers over his beats but this brought him to the album fold where other rappers started getting timbaland for their albums that same year and all the years following so i feel like that's innovative that's him having that thing that we've come to know Jay-Z for. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not giving him credit for that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think Timberland would have, nah, I'm not giving him credit for that. I'm sorry. Because don't forget, he, Timberland already had a classic. Like, can we not, are we, are we going to act like Missy isn't a rapper? I don't care that people look at Missy like, oh, the streets don't, I don't give a fuck about that. Like, <laughs> oh, all right, yeah, I got a Jay, I got Jay-Z so that, okay, did it give him street cred? Sure. But I'm not giving Jay Z credit for giving Timbaland his start. I'm sorry. You can, okay, you can not sorry, but that look, that validation. I'm not. No, I'm not giving him that. Fair enough. Uh, influence. You talked about like who who refers to this album when Pusha T was uh, making the It's Almost Dry album in articles. He talked yeah, about how he went sure. back and revisited Hard Knock Life. He wanted to recapture that feel. That hard knock life. But you're saying, you're talking about a mediocre album influencing another mediocre album. Oh, it takes it takes a lot. All right, what you giving the impact, influence, and innovation on this album? A one. A one. It had impact. It gets a get a two for impact because the impact was major. So two. Yeah. But no innovation, no influence. I'm this good. album goes five times platinum. It's to this day Jay Z's highest selling album. And let's also give credence to the the era that it was, the time that it was. This is when albums were going platinum like hotcakes. Yeah, three hundred fifty thousand in the first week. Jay Z yeah. sold. And so it 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 only took two years to go like quintuple platinum. It was already platinum or double platinum the same year. All right, final dimension, dimension ten. This is super easy for you because I think you've been saying this the whole episode. How timeless and unique is this album? Zero. That is not a classic. You stand by that. I stand by it. Yeah. I'm uh, very, like, I'm very, I'm very, I'm very hard on the word classic, dog. And I think Jay-Z has three classic albums under his belt. I just don't think this is one of them. All right. You said earlier that some of the beats are dated. Anything on this album dated to the point where you cringe <laughs> when it comes off? I mean, yeah, Money Cash Holes is like the shit he, no, I'm just playing, but no, um, not really, I don't cringe, but it's just like, this is not peak Jay-Z, this is not, this is not the best, like, just at the time, this was the best that we've seen Jay-Z at that, at this point, so I'm going, I, I, I always try to grade it on that curve, but it was just like, again, he was hit chasing, you know what I'm saying, like, gotcha, so if you were introducing this to a youngin right now, you don't think they could get into it? I think they could get into it because Jay Z is a good. It's it's good. Like I don't think the album's ass, right? It's a good album. Like I'm not. 
I like look. So I, I give albums a letter grade between an A and an F, right? This album is about a C, C minus, if I'm being honest, right? That's not that's a passing grade, right? That means that somebody could like it's like yeah, I see what he's doing, or I, I see, but it ain't nothing crazy to me. No. Gotcha. All right, what you giving it from one to five? On on timelessness and unique zero zero Sam. I don't know if we've if we've gotten a zero before. A like, one. Okay, well, you'll get a one. I mean, it could be zero. That's fine. But yeah, we'll, we'll air it towards the one since you said it last. And on that note, y'all, that's how we conclude this category one review of Hard Knock Life by Jay-Z. 25 years old this year. Uh, Mr. Clint Cully, can you tell them where they can find you and what you got cooking next? Uh, I can't tell you what I got cooking, but I can tell you that just follow me at Clint Coley, C-L-I-N-T. Name is right there, I guess. Uh, and follow me on, you know, just follow me. I, You know, I'm, I'm not one of those guys. Like, when I come on somebody's podcast, man, I like to talk. If you want to follow me, that's cool. But I like to really, you know, get into and dive into the topic. If you like my perspective, if you like that, you know, like, look, I know my takes aren't popular. I know that, you know, how, you, how I feel about music is not how everybody else feels about music. But for me, I want y'all to know this. There's always an educated opinion on behind what I say. On second, on on top of that, you know, the bigger part to this is is that for me, when it comes to uh, my music takes, I always try to get people to understand. Like I'm very like words like classic, words like legend, words like that they mean very near and dear to me, right? Then I don't just I don't just call everybody and everything a classic. I don't call everything and everybody legend. So. You know, when we when we when we have these conversations, yeah, I'm going to be judging it. If you're going to say something is a classic, like prom, where 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 my thoughts even stem from is, if we say songs in the key of life is a classic album, can this album, whatever album that you name, I'm not saying it has to be better. I'm not saying it's worse. I'm saying is is it in the same conversation? Meaning, is it in the same breath? Is it in the same like? Are we like? I can legitimately give you legitimate reasons why the blueprint and b- both the blueprint and Saws in the Key of Life are in the same conversation hmm. of what they did for each other's genre respectively and what they did for music respectively. Hard Knock that. Life is not in that conversation. <laughs> I'd love to hear that combo, man. That's exactly why uh, we made this episode happen. You sought out because you're someone that's after the same thing. Uh, we just want educated opinion conversation here. But yeah, man, uh, thank you for, for being here. Uh, me and Clint go way back when he was in New York. Uh, shout out to the homie Sam. Y'all yeah, know, man. Y'all know what it is. Until next time, effort rap critic. They talk about it while I live it. Word to meth. <laughs> <laughs>